Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's podcast, I will be doing the last of the Share Talk update summaries for all the covers with companies that we covered in Share Talk in 2021. And there seems to be very little link between how popular a podcast was and the performance of the shares. So I think we'll be covering some interesting companies in this batch. And I've also updated all the share talk summaries to account for recent share price movements due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But before I get started, I will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Full disclaimer can be found at the end. Okay, first up is Metal Tiger, which is a mining investment vehicle that takes equity stakes in mainly listed companies. So it um, participates in fundraisings by existing listed mining companies mainly for shares and warrants. And we first covered it in on the 26th of March last year. Since then, the podcast had 371 views and the shares are down 11% since then, and we were negative. Okay, so this is the share price and it has had a volatile year. At one stage, the share price had shot up and our negativity looked misplaced, but since then, the shares have drifted steadily off. Okay, now, when we first covered Metal Tiger, we were concerned that its business model didn't really work. Essentially, what it does is when a small mining company needs to raise money for mainly exploration, Metal Tiger will participate in the share placing in return for shares and warrants. But most of the companies it invests in are listed. So it is possible for private investors to buy the shares in most of its investee companies on their own, avoiding Metal Tiger's very substantial costs. And so we remain unconvinced by the business model. In H1 2021, the company reported an NAV of 31.3 million and annualized costs were about 2.5 million, hence about 8% of NAV. You know, over five years, that's 40%. Over 10 years, that's 80%. And I think if you're interested in the assets that Metal Tiger have, and it's got some very interesting assets in the Kalahari Copper Belt, for instance, it would be better to simply go out and buy the shares in the underlying company rather than avoid 8% per annum in costs. So hence, we were negative then, we're negative now, and... The fact the shares have underperformed is no surprise, and I will now cease coverage. So next up is Orcadian Energy, a North Sea oil exploration company with heavy oil assets that it needs to develop. And we covered it on the 22nd of October 2021, so only four months ago. Podcast has since had 340 views, and we were neutral and the shares have since returned 16%, most of that in the last few days, as you can see. So we were contacted by the CEO of Orcadian Energy, Steve Brown, who asked us to look at the company. And the bottom line is we really liked it. It has a collection of proven heavy oil assets in the North Sea, which were discovered long ago generally by other oil companies, but were then uneconomic. 
to develop. And Orcadian is planning to use a polymer flood to raise the recovery rates and get all those fields into production. Our concern then was simply the funding. And we know that farming out any development in the North Sea is very difficult as I3 Energy have discovered they have been attempting to farm out the Serenity field, which is light oil in the North Sea for many years now. We thought it wiser to wait until Orcadian had actually secured funding before investing, but we liked both management and assets. Now, since then, there have been a couple of minor developments. It's received 475 million to write a white paper on using local floating wind, wind turbines to support the electrification of North Sea oil platforms. And it's received expressions of interest from various FPSO providers for the pilot development, but no news on funding. And so hence, if we look at it on the mineral life cycle, mineral discovery life cycle, you see it's very much stuck down here, awaiting development. As soon as it's got funding, then we will take another look at it. So in summary, no change to our original view, but we're awaiting funding and funding is substantial. It um, will require around 1.1 billion sterling to develop the pilot field. So originally neutral, now neutral. Okay, moving on to Entech Technologies, which does downhole instruments for the oil and gas drilling industry. So we covered it in February last year. The podcast has since had 286 views. We were strongly positive and the shares have been a big disappointment, down 16%. A lot of that has been in the last six months with share price just drifting steadily off. So what Entech do is currently they sell measurement while drilling tools and that connects the drill bit to headquarters and that allows drillers to read in real time what sort of conditions the drill head is encountering during the drill and therefore to redirect the drill head where necessary. But the reason we liked Enteg was not because of their small existing measurement while drilling business, but because they were developing a new rotatable steering system, which had originally been designed by Shell called Sabre. And Sabre is an entirely new design which they claim will revolutionize um, rotatable steering systems. Now, the market, according to Entech, for rotatable steering systems is about two billion per annum, whereas the market for measurement while drilling is only about 100 million. So if Entech can successfully get the Sabre tool into the market that has the potential to transform the revenues of the company. And so far, Sabre has passed all of its tests, both in the field and in the lab. And we have very recently had a new update from the company which frankly didn't really contain very much of interest, but the company will be presenting Sabre at a webinar on the 1st of March. And I'm going to repurpose the min mineral discovery life cycle because I think it's also appropriate for new technology. And essentially, we have been in this testing and development phase for the last two or three years, during which time, the company is spending money on development with nothing to show for it. There's very little news flow coming out. But now, hopefully, we are entering commercialization. And 
as Entech start to get deals for the Sabre system, then hopefully you get a, a constant flow of positive news flow, which would be very good for the share price. And a reminder, this currently is a very, very small company. It's a market cap is below 10 million in the six months to 30th of September 2021, which is the last data available. It had revenue of only $2.3 million and made an EBITDA loss. It has around 5.3 million on the balance sheet. So that's about 4 million cash. So of that 10 million market cap, about 4 million is cash, but it is steadily consuming cash as it invests in the design of the Sabre system. And it is then going to have to invest in inventory for Sabre. So in order to rent them out, it's going to have to build a few and that will require cash. So it's an open question of whether they will require to do a fundraise, although they are saying they can probably fund that through bank facilities. So the 24th of February trading update said that trading was in line with expectations and sales of the measurement mile drilling tools was improving with the US market. So in summary, we hope 2022 will be transformative for Intech as Sabre enters the marketplace and starts to get new deals. And if they can, they'll be entering a market with annual sales of 2 billion compared to just 100 million for measurement world drilling. Although one of our Discord members, Dodkins, has pointed out that we get the 2 billion number from Entech. So it might be prudent to halve that number, but still, it is a much bigger market than measurement while drilling. So previously we were strongly positive. I remain strongly positive. Okay, and now on to Alta Strategies, which is a mining investment and royalty company. Now, we last covered it back in March 2021. Podcast has since had 268 views. The share price then was 80p. And sadly, we were mildly positive and the share price has since down 30%. Now, I liked the management and... I quite like the business model, but what I didn't like was the fact the share price had absolutely shot up from about 20p to 80p when we covered it. And I thought the shares were then fully valued. And so hence, we were only mildly positive. And I think those concerns have been fully justified by the fact the share price has drifted steadily off since. But Altus has had a busy year. It's done a host of deals that have built royalties. So it has purchased a net smelter royalty on the Casaronis copper mine in Chile. And then it has purchased a portfolio of gold royalties, mainly in Australia from Newcrest. And those combined have changed the portfolio of assets of the company quite profoundly and also provided instant royalty income because previously it was only a collection of very early stage development assets. So it's a bit of an odd mix, Altus. It has these pre-royalty assets where essentially it is investing in proving up these assets and then aims to find investment partners to bring them to development. So it's constantly pouring money into drilling and exploration on these early stage assets. And then separately, it has these recently acquired royalty streams. So it's now saying that Casaronis will bring in around $3.9 million in 
2022 and the Newcrest portfolio will bring in about two and a half total about 6.4 and it's got big ambitions so it's aiming to acquire more royalty portfolios but the question is how much is that going to cost and how much of that will be in equity because it has had to issue equity to fund the new crest deal and so the fear would be that there could be quite a lot of shareholder dilution along the way and this is what the current royalty cash flow forecasts are and you'll see that the new crest portfolio is due to essentially peak in the next five years now the assets they bought from new crest are mainly australian gold mines although bon Bonicro is in the Ivory Coast, but with it came a whole host of Australian royalties, which are in pre, essentially pre-production phase, the vast majority of them. So there is the potential for upside as these mines get developed in the coming years and Altus have big ambitions, as can be seen from this chart. Pause and have a look. So they have a big pipeline, they claim, of assets coming through to produce royalties in future years. And their pre-royalty pyramid, i.e. their development assets, again, they've got they hope a whole host of developments slowly moving towards development with a joint venture partner. And an example of that is the Deba project in Mali, which is currently 100% owned by Altus, and they are attempting to prove up the resource and then find a joint venture partner. We mentioned earlier that the royalty portfolio would bring in around. $6.4 million in 2022. But if you look at the quarterly results, you'll see that they have constantly spending on exploration to firm up the resources in their development portfolio. And if you look at all their costs, that comes to around $7 million a year. So the royalty income will be entirely consumed by corporate costs and will leave little or nothing for shareholders. So when we did our original share talk, we went through the economics for Altus of the development of their tobacco roly prospect. Although it is a very big resource with 910,000 ounces of gold, of which 290,000 ounces are indicated and 620,000 inferred. And together, that would equate to around one and a half billion dollars worth of gold. Altus would receive a maximum of about 30 million from the joint venture if the mine is successfully developed and frankly i just don't think that's good enough so altus have a market cap of what 91 million and this is one of their big prospects and clearly somebody's going to make a great deal of money out of this but altus will make only a bit and i worry that 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 is just not good enough it's got this collection of pre early stage assets which it needs to firm up many of whom where they will spend money on without anything ever coming to fruition. And the ones that do work, you want them to have very good economics. I'm just not sure the economics here are good enough. So in summary, I really like the management. The management are very um, responsive to shareholders. They've got an interesting business model where they're actually doing the work, unlike 
let's say, metal tiger because they're out in the field searching for new mineral deposits, doing the work in exploration and firming up the resource before forming a joint venture to exploit them. And they have big ambitions. They've been doing lots of deals, adding royalties, and they intend to do more in the future. But in order to do that, they need to keep on raising funds. So in December, they raised 19.8 million at 53.5p. And if they do more royalty deals, will they require further funding? I suspect they will. So in summary, we were then mildly positive and concerned the shares were overvalued. I'm now slightly more than mildly positive, but I'm concerned that their early stage projects will take a very long time to come to fruition. And I hope that the deals they do going forward have better economics than the ones they have done in the past. Okay, next up is independent oil and gas, which is a North Sea gas producer, which is due to have first gas anytime now. So we first covered it in March last year. The podcast since had 266 views and we were positive and it's been great because the shares have more than doubled. And I personally added a lot more to my original small position in independent oil and gas as the European gas, pri- gas crisis developed over the course of last year, as we covered regularly in our weekly update. So this is independent oil and gas. Share price have been trending steadily upwards in part because of the gas price. Now, in the last couple of days, this is the Dutch natural gas price. The gas price has shot up to about 111. And the war between Russia and Ukraine is likely to lead to disruptions in gas supplies, which would cause the European gas price to remain elevated. And that should be very good for independent oil and gas. And this is the UK natural gas future, which likewise has shot up in the last day or so. Okay, so independent oil and gas have a collection of gas assets in the Southern North Sea, many of which are known discoveries which were discovered years ago by other oil companies, but then considered uneconomic and abandoned. And independence essentially purchased the license for all these minor fields and is now making a hub, a Southern North Sea hub for development. So phase one, we'll see the Elgood and Blythe fields come into operation. Now, that was due to happen by the end of last year, and Elgood and Blythe have now been connected to the gas pipeline network, but the refurbishment of the reception facilities at Bacton has not yet been completed, and the latest RNS complained about COVID disruptions and damage from Storm Eunice, and that will put back first gas until the first week in March. So fingers crossed that first gas is imminent. Then in Q3, we'll have appraisal wells on Goddard and in Kellam North and Central. This is their map of developments over the coming year. And you'll see that Q1, in the next couple of weeks, we should have first gas from Blythe and Elgood. And then in Q2, first gas from Southwark. But Southwark has suffered with rig problems and cost overruns. Then in Q3, we'll have Goddard and Kellam North and Central appraisal wells, and they'll start working on the northern and southern hubs development. 
Now, this is their reserves. Many of the fields they're hoping to develop were discovered by other oil companies a long time ago. So Nailsworth was discovered by Shell and Exxon in 87, Goddard by Arco in 1994, Eland by Silverstone in 2006, and Abbeydale by Mobile in 1996. So we know the resource is there. The question is, how will it flow? And we don't know that until an appraisal well has been drilled. But Half the work has already been done, the difficult bit of discovery for a lot of these fields. There was, this is the Bacton update from the 21st of February. Storm Eunice has knocked back um, the final construction and leak testing program at Bacton, but they should begin degassing next week and first gas a week after. For independent, the shares have doubled in the past year, despite the fact they haven't actually had any gas to sell, despite very high gas markets in Europe. And they have certainly missed the winter peak UK when gas prices were extraordinarily high. This again proves the accuracy of the mineral discovery life cycle chart, because actually all that performance came during the development phase. And now we're moving into the startup phase. And then the valuation will be on realized cash flows. But how much hope is already in the price? Now, the other assets, Nailsworth, Goddard, Eland, etc., they are in the appraisal phase. Now, is that there? So good appraisal and discovery results could see in an uplift in the share price from its other assets. So in summary, we are waiting first gas from Blythe and Elwood. But I mean, my fundamental concern about independent oil and gas is that the share prices have doubled already and it hasn't had any income. So how much of the good news is already in the price? Now, Arden, the house broker, have fair value for independence, about 40p, and the share price is 34p. So how much upside is there without good news on exploration? Our original view was positive. I'm going to move to mildly positive, frankly. I'd like to see what the economics actually are. And for that, we need first gas. Okay, next up is Saga, the company that specializes in insurance and travel services for the over 50s, but actually their core demographic is the over 70s. Now, we covered the company back in February last year. The podcast has since had 247 views. And since then, the shares are up 14%. We were strongly positive. The shares have had a volatile year. Early optimism in first half 2021 that COVID was over led to a sustained bull run in the share price, which then unwound on the back of COVID restrictions and Omicron. Then in the last few days, we've had a big sell-off due to the Ukraine crisis. I am disappointed that our Saga podcast has had so few views because I think Saga is a very interesting turnaround story. And it was originally brought to my attention by Paul Scott of Stockopedia, who really likes the shares and it is his largest holding. So... Saga is a turnaround situation. Essentially, it was sold to private equity and private equity did their usual trick of loading it up with debt and giving it a short term focus. So it tried to exploit customer loyalty by giving them teaser rates on their insurance. And then when it came to renewal, raising their insurance rates by around 30%. And that whole business model was undermined by price comparison sites, which allowed 
their customers to realize that Saga was ripping them off and leading to an exodus of customers and a collapse in the share price. New management headed by the son of the founder have come back in and they are attempting to purge the company of its short-term focus and turn it around with an emphasis on quality of service. So what went wrong with Saga? Well, it was floated back in 2014 at a price of £27.75 by private equity companies, Permira, Charterhouse and CVC. And this is the share price performance. A couple of years where it seems to do well, and then it was steadily losing customers. The insurance um, side was declining, and that led to big fall in the share price because the combination of falling profits and high debts is never a good one. Okay, so let's go through its most recent trading update. Now, the good news is the insurance side has stabilized. So it has customer retention rates of about 82%, solid margins per policy, and Bottom line, the insurance side is now a stable source of revenue and profits with but little growth. That has offset the losses from the travel side during COVID. Now, the travel side, well, just prior to COVID, Saga had invested in two new cruise ships, which has never really had a chance to use at their full operating capacity. Now, in the second half of 2021, cruises were EBITDA positive with a load factor of 68%, after, but after accounting for depreciation and the loan costs, they lost money. Going forward in 2022-23, they have very strong bookings. The load factor is 86% for the first half already and 73 for the full year. And day rates have increased by around 6%. So they've got very good customer loyalty. But I do question whether a rise of only 6% in the day rate is enough, given that they have rising uh, fuel costs and presumably rising wage bills on the finance side. Well, total debt is enormous, 764 million. Most of which, though, is was taken out for the cruise ships. And they expect to make a small underlying loss for the last year. But when the two cruise ships get back to full operational capacity, you hope that they will make a good profit. So in summary, Saga is very well placed to benefit from finally a recover in the travel sector as COVID disruptions cease. And it's got a lot of debt, but it's got cash and there are no immediate debt repayments. And I think all it would take is a small turnaround in its fortunes to see the shares fly. It targets a growing demographic, the elderly. Um, and all the indications are that it has stabilized the insurance side. It's got a loyal customer base. If travel comes back, it should do well. And I have been buying more shares recently. So we are originally strongly positive. I remain strongly positive. Okay, next up is the oil services company, Gulf Marine Services, which we covered only a couple of months ago. And share the podcast has since had 246 views and the shares are up 14% and we were positive. Okay, so this is a highly indebted turnaround situation, which is very high risk. Um, so this is the share price recently. 
if you are interested, go please go and have a look at our original share talk where we go through all the corporate shenanigans of the last couple of years, and I will not go through that again. So this is the long term performance, and it's not been good. So Gulf Marine Services rents out these self elevating support vessels. And this is a slide from our original share talk, which is not out of date. It was only a couple of months ago. And essentially new management have come in. The old management basically invested in expanding the fleet at the wrong time. And the downturn in the oil market meant that essentially they took on a lot of debt to expand the fleet, which was then not utilized. And the shares collapsed as the debt to um, EBITDA ratio kept on growing. And previous management were essentially talking about doing a debt for equity swap and warning that there may be very little left for shareholders. But new management come in, they have renegotiated the bank debt and all the debt in the banks. And they raised $25 million last year to uh, reassure the banks. And their agreement with the banks is that they need to raise a further $50 million this year. Now, if the market for self-elevating support vessels continues to improve, there's the possibility the government services would be able to raise debt to repay $50 million worth of bank loans, as opposed to having to raise it from shareholders. And obviously, they can raise debt that is much better for shareholders. And we calculated then that the shares were very cheap on a forward PE ratio of 2.9. But this is a high risk situation. If the market were to turn down, then government services would find it difficult to raise the money and the whole company could end up in the arms of the banks. So since then, we've had two new contract announcements. So on the 21st of December, they announced two new contracts for E-class vessels, which are the medium-sized vessels, a six-month contract in Europe commencing in the summer and a five-month contract with the Middle Eastern National Oil Company that has already started. And then on the 17th of February, they announced contract for a small K-class vessel, again, Middle East National Oil Company, and secured utilization for 2022 is now 79%. In the earlier January trading update, they stated that 2021 vessel utilization ended at 85% and they had EBITDA of 63 to 65 million, which is very good. And they've got a current bidding pipeline of 216 million and they're guiding for 2022 EBITDA between 70 and 80 million. Now, one of the reasons we're attracted to Gulf Marine Services is that the pricing dynamics of this market any leasing market are that as soon as utilization rates approach 100%, you also get increases in day rates. So you get this self reinforcing cycle where, uh, whereby, as potential customers find that there are not enough self elevating support vessels to go around, they start having to bid for the few remaining ones, leading to rising prices and nobody has been investing in new capacity so no new self-elevating support vessels are going to come into this market so as capex returns the oil market you would hope to see rising profits for gulf marine services which will enable it to start paying down the debt and the company will move out of the high risk category and hopefully that will be very good news for the shares Okay, so in summary, this is a highly indebted turnaround situation, which we only covered a couple of months ago. So please go back and have a look. We calculated it was on a P ratio of 2.9 and a cash flow yield of 72%. But obviously, 
the big question mark over the shares is the very large debts. So our original view was positive, I would make positive. Okay, next up is the gold recovery specialist, Gold Platt, which we covered back in January last year. And the podcast has since had only 235 views, which is disappointing because I really like Gold Platt and the shares are down 5%. We were positive. This is share price, shares going absolutely nowhere. And essentially, it seems to be rather following the gold price as opposed to the news from Gold Platt, which has been very positive. So the great thing about Gold Platt is it doesn't mine its own gold. What it does is it takes mine waste from gold miners and extracts the gold. So for example, it takes the wooden support struts from gold mines, it burns the wood and takes out the, the gold. So it buys these struts in. And that means that it is less fuel intensive than traditional gold mining. And so it will not be suffering as much from a rising oil price. OK, so there have been quite a few developments this year from Gold Platt. First of all, it bought out some of its minority interests. So its main operating subsidiary is Gold Platt Recovery Limited, which had 26% minority interest. It has bought 16.65% of GRL from the minority interests. And because GRL essentially bought this stake itself, the net cost to Gold Platt is only 3.35 million. And that was partly funded through a three million pound loan. Now, the deal valued GRL at 20.2 million, but the whole gold plat is valued at 12.8 million. So the deal was at a substantial premium to the market price, but was not unreasonable in itself, in that GRL had post-tax profits of 4.55 million in the year ending June 21. So what's that, a P ratio of four, four and a half, and also had assets of 11.7. So the share price of Gold Platt would seem to materially undervalue the company to me, rather than Gold Platt having overpaid for the minority interest. The other big news was they sold the problem Kilimapesa mine to Caracal Gold. Now, Kilimapesa was a gold mine that essentially Gold Platt had been attempting to make economic and failed, and it would have been put in care and maintenance, and that was actually costing Gold Platt quite a lot of money every year. So they've now sold Kilimapesa, and they own a million pounds worth of Caracal shares. And they also have a net smelter royalty on the Kilimapesa mine. And as that ramps up, if Caracal can achieve its target of 2000 ounces per month, that would bring in revenues of 160,000 sterling per annum to Gold Platt. But the deal essentially get, removes a liability and swaps it for a producing asset. So that's all good news. Now, when we did our original share talk, the big concern was Ghana. Ghana had had variable profitability because they had had difficulty securing stable waste inflows from local mines. Now that situation has much improved and Ghana is now solidly profitable. And so in Q2, Ghana produced a profit of a million pounds and South African operations produced profit of 1.34 million. And that was helped by falling costs and a rising gold price. In addition, the group is investing $300,000 in expanding South American operations 
which will allow it to process low grade waste locally in South America. So the purpose of the South American operations is to source high grade waste to ship across to the Ghana operations. By investing 300,000 in the South American operations, there is the potential for a new hub to develop there to process South American waste locally. They are also investing 300,000 in a platinum group metal processing plant in South Africa. But the big news for me is they've applied for a license for a pipeline which will allow them to pump material from the, the tailing storage facility to a local processing plant. And the tailing storage facility has an estimated 82,000 ounces of gold, and that is worth about 148 million. Now, and obviously it will cost quite a lot to extract that gold and the processing company will take their share. But for a company with a market cap of only 13 million pounds, if they can um, unlock even a fraction of the value stored in the tailing storage facility, that could be transformative for the share price. And they currently have a cash balance of 1.45 million and cash at the operating entities of 3.85 million. Although I'm not sure how they're accounting for the Ned Bank loan. We'll have to wait until the next results are out. So in summary, these shares just seem ludicrously cheap for me, to me. I don't think the, the market has appreciated the turnaround at Gold Platt now that they have concentrated just on the gold recovery side and they're no longer doing the mining. So Kilima Passa is gone. And if you look at H1 2020 profits, they equate to a P ratio of about 2.2. And it's cash generative. Hopefully, it should soon start paying a dividend, although it is investing in various things such as the PGM plant and South American operations. But you know, if you can unlock even a fraction of value in the uh, TCF, there's a lot of value here. It is now consistently uh, profitable and with potential upsides. So original view was positive. I'm now very strongly positive. It is the only gold miner I own and I have been buying more recently. And finally, Capital Limited, which does contract drilling and lab services for mining companies. We covered it back in February last year, and the podcast has since had a very disappointing 140 views. And we were very positive, and the shares are up 50% since we covered it. So this is the share price. In the last few days, it's come off as Russia's invaded Ukraine, but also the share buyback program is sadly over for now, and that drove a decent um, increase in the price. So this is a mining service company that does drilling, contract drilling, and lab services, contract mining actually, and it has strong earnings growth, and the shares of good value, which is a very good investment combination. Okay, so if we go through the latest figures from Stockopedia see that had very strong revenue growth in the last couple of years. In 2021, revenues will almost double. But then growth is expected to slow substantially in the coming year to only about 15%. I'm not sure why they're estimating that uh, profits will fall next year. Um, but earnings per share should continue to rise, to rise and revenues side and margins have been rising, return on equity has been rising and they pay good dividends. And this is from the Q4 trading update. You see steadily rising revenues up 8% quarter on quarter, 92% year on year. 
as they're kicking off quite a lot of cash, they have recently completed a share buyback program in which they purchased 2 million shares. And here are some recent contract wins. A lot of their contracts are with large multinationals. So first of these is three-year production drilling contract with Anglo Ashanti Anglo Gold Ashanti in Tanzania. Pause and have a read if you're interested. So in summary, this is a growth share that's also good value. And so I think this is a very good investment. It's had strong revenue growth of 68% in 2021, although that's expected to slow in the coming year. And its lab services division, which is much higher margin, is a growing contributor to earnings. Um, forecast P ratio of 7.9, dividend yield of two and a half. It's been uh, buying back its shares. And it also has a portfolio of direct investment. So it, it drills for shares. So it takes shares in the company. And its portfolio of direct investments has risen from 29.1 million to 59.1 in the past year as um, the gold price and copper prices have all risen since their pre since their COVID lows. But a lot of its contracts are with gold miners. Gold miners had a very strong, strong 2020 and 21 as the gold price rose. Now the gold price is stalled. Will exploration and development also slow? And that would be bad for capital. But the shares are cheap. Revenues are still growing. There would seem to be a good margin of safety here. So. We were originally positive. The shares are up 50% and I remain. Okay, that is it. And I've now completed looking at all 39 of the companies that we covered in Share Talk last year. I have not covered a few of the companies that we have decided to cease coverage of, such as Advanced Energy for obvious reasons, Bushfeld Minerals for obvious reasons. Um, and I will now move on to getting back to doing some original share talks. But thank you for watching. Please can you press like and subscribe to the channel and it's goodbye from me, Keith Jordan, goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.